Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the concept of demand and how it relates to your everyday life. <clears throat> and so, first off, let's do a couple of different terms. So the first one we'll talk about is uh, the concept of substitutes. And so by substitutes, economists don't just mean, you know, substitute teachers. Uh, though, though substitute teachers are certainly substitutes for teachers as well, we're going to be talking about uh, any two or more goods that can be used uh, at least somewhat interchangeably. Okay, so any two or more goods that can be used at least somewhat interchangeably would be considered substitutes. Okay, so obvious examples of this uh, would be, let's say, uh, artificial sweetener and sugar, right? So uh, most of the time, you know, we have our preferences for one or the other, uh, but I'm willing to bet that in a pinch, those of you who like sugar uh, might be willing to use artificial sweetener in your coffee. And those of you who prefer uh, artificial sweetener uh, might also be willing uh, to use, say, uh, art like real sugar if necessary. Okay, so other examples would be uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Uh, you could do orange juice and apple juice in the morning, right, because both of them are, are good breakfast drinks. Uh, you could do, uh, let's see, uh, cigars and cigarettes are at some level in uh, substitutes for one another. Um, you know, there are tons and tons of different uh, examples of substitutes. You could say hot dogs and hamburgers, um, you know, Ford cars and uh, Honda car. Uh, all of these things are, are basically the same thing and we can use them interchangeably. Okay. Uh, so any two or more goods that can be used at least somewhat interchangeably are considered to be substitutes. The easy way to think about this is uh, what would I do if the price of X, whatever X is, rose to uh, you know, let's say one billion dollars, right? So what would you do if the price of something rose to a billion dollars? So let's say uh, the tuition at whatever college you're at right now rises to a billion dollars per year. Uh, what would you do? Well, you might transfer to a different school. And so we would consider uh, those two schools to be substitutes, right? What if, um, what if the price of taking the bus in the morning rose to a billion dollars, right? You might consider uh, buying a bicycle and riding your bike to work or to school, right? And so those would be substitutes. Though, uh, in the case of the bike and the bus example, they're not necessarily great substitutes for one another, right? Clearly, uh, you might prefer to ride the bus, especially if the weather is not exactly great, uh, but Nonetheless, we would still consider them substitutes because at some price you switch from riding the bus to taking uh, a bike instead. Okay. Uh, by the same token, we also have uh, goods that we consider to be uh, complements. And these are uh, any two or more goods that are consumed together. Okay, so uh, some examples of these would be uh, hot dogs and hot dog buns. Uh, since it's an election year right now, uh, you could consider presidents and vice presidents to be complements of one another. You could consider, you know, your mouse, your key, your mouse, and your keyboard to be complements because you use them both together. Uh, the ultimate co uh, combination of goods for college students, at least from uh, my observations here, uh, are that uh, beer and pizza are complementary goods, right? So, so complements are any 
two or more goods that you use or consume together. And I'm sure you can think of plenty others, you know, cars and gasoline, cell phones and cell phone chargers. Um, you know, you can think of cable services and television, right? Because you can't really use uh, cable without television. And so you consume those two things together. Uh, so, so complements and substitutes, you know, the list goes on and on uh, for both of them. Okay, now, uh, when it comes to <clears throat> thinking like an economist in, in terms of uh, demand, what we're typically concerned with are what we call uh, marginal benefits. Right? So a marginal benefit just means the benefit, or more accurately, the additional benefit, received for consuming one more unit of the good X All right so uh, what we could say is that each additional unit uh, that you get brings you additional happiness, right? You get some additional benefit from continuing to do something. So let's think about uh, when you're playing, let's say, video games, right? Each uh, additional minute or game that you play uh, confers upon you some additional benefit, right? And so uh, what we think about, or what, we can, what this means is that we are no longer thinking about you know, all of the video games or none of the video games. So we're thinking about each additional game, right? So if you play, uh, let's say you're playing, you know, Super Mario World, you don't have to consider the benefit of beating every single level when you're playing. You want to think about the continued benefit of playing the next level, right? Or the next stage, right? Uh, or we can use this type of reasoning to sort of think about uh, what economists have called the water diamond paradox, right? And the water diamond paradox, uh, stated simply, is uh, water sustains life. Water sustains life and diamonds look pretty. Why is the price of water lower than diamonds? All right? So if water sustains life and diamonds uh, just look pretty. Now today I recognize that there are uh, a lot of uh, commercial uses for diamonds, but back in the 1800s when this paradox was alive and well and still unsolved, uh, diamonds just looked pretty. That's all they were. They really didn't have uh, too many commercial uses for diamonds. But it was still the case that diamonds were uh, more expensive than water. And so this puzzled economists for hundreds of years, right? And the answer lies in thinking about, mar thinking about water and diamonds at the margin or thinking about the marginal benefit of consuming one more diamond versus one more, let's say, glass of water, right? And so think about uh, what what you do with the like. What if I gave you a glass of water right now? How happy would you be, right? You probably wouldn't be uh, terribly excited. You know, you've got plenty of water. Uh, I'm willing to bet that no one watching this video is. Uh, suffering from severe dehydration right now. And if you are, you can pause this and go run uh, to the sink and get a glass of water, right? Or to the drinking fountain if you're on campus somewhere. Uh, or, you know, if, if worst case scenario, right, you could go to the gas station and plunk down $1.29 and get a bottle of water, 
right? And so uh, if I were, if you really needed it, like it's it's very easy for you to find. Um, and if I just gave you one, you wouldn't exactly be that excited about it. You'd be like, oh, cool, I have a glass of water now, great, right? Uh, but if I gave you a diamond, uh, all of a sudden you went from having uh, very few diamonds to having a diamond, right? Uh, you have tons of water that you've already consumed today, uh, I assume, right? And so one more unit of water is, is just not worth that much to you, right? And so uh, its price is low because you've already had so much and the additional or the marginal benefit that you get from one more glass of water is very, very low. But I'm willing to bet that very few of you uh, have uh, somehow consumed a diamond today. And so if I gave you a diamond, uh, you would be uh, thrilled because there's lots of things that you could do now, right? You could set it in a ring, you could set it in uh, some sort of a necklace perhaps. Uh, there's lots of things that, that having one more diamond uh, would open up to you. And so what the paradox comes from thinking about all the water in the world, having all the water at once or no water whatsoever, versus having all the diamonds or no diamonds, right? And so what marginal analysis or the idea of thinking at the margin, and in this case, thinking about marginal benefits allows us to do is to explain why we're so, we're not willing to pay such a high, a high price for water because we've had so much of it already. Whereas we are willing to pay a high price for diamonds because we've had very few of them, right? And so if you, if you need further evidence of how much water you have, by the way, uh, consider the following. Uh, you fill your toilet with perfectly clean water, or at least water that is clean by the standards of 99% of the population of, of the earth that has ever existed. Uh, and then, without going into too much detail, uh, you, f you make it dirty and you flush it. Right uh, Today, there are thousands if not millions of people around the world uh, who would be very happy to have that toilet water uh, that you flushed down the toilet, uh, even oh, preferably before you made it dirty, uh, but they would be willing to have that water, and in fact, they, they, today, they will walk miles to get a couple gallons of, of semi-clean water, uh, and you take perfectly clean water, put it in the toilet, and flush it down. Right. Uh, so just think about that for a minute. How much, how affordable and plentiful clean water is in the United States uh, versus the rest of the world? Okay. <clears throat> and so when we talk about these things, we're not talking about having water or not having water. All right. We're talking about having additional units of water or additional units of diamonds. Okay. And so recognizing this, recognizing this idea of, of additional benefits and marginal benefits and such leads us very clearly to what we could call and what we do call the demand curve, right? And what the demand curve is, is a relationship between the price that we are willing to pay and the amount uh, that we are willing to buy. We have price on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis, and we have a downward sloping demand curve, which just says that at high prices, at a really high price, we're only willing to buy a few of the good. But at a low price, we're willing to buy many more. Right? And so this is the idea that if you walk into a store and you see that everything's on sale, uh, you actually get excited. Right? You don't walk into a store and you know, find out that there's a sale and say, oh, you know, shoot, 
right? Things are on sale today. What a terrible thing, right? As a buyer, you are very excited about this. And so the demand curve uh, is about buyers and their behavior. We could also, instead of drawing it as a graph, we could express it as a table where we have, you know, price and what we call the quantity demanded. And so let's say uh, the price is, you know, 10 and at that price we'll buy 1 and let's say we drop the price to 9 and we buy 2 and 8 and 3 six and four and five and five right and so on and so on right what we would say is that at a price of nine we are willing to purchase two of this unit of this good right so the quantity demanded at a price of nine is two okay <clears throat> and so what this is getting at or what this is introducing is the idea of a difference between uh, what we call demand and quantity demanded. All right? These are two very different things. So notice that what I did here, right, is I expressed this curve as a series of points over here, right? This curve and this table are the same thing, okay? But this curve and any one of these numbers are not the same thing at all, right? They're completely different, okay? So we could think of demand, right? Uh, demand as an equation is an equation, a line, or a table, and it represents your willingness to buy. Quantity demand, which we usually abbreviate just Q sub D, <clears throat> is a point, right, <clears throat> or a number, uh, a number, and it is the amount purchased at a given price, okay? <clears throat> and so what this is saying, right, is that there's a difference between your demand and the number you buy, right? These are two completely different concepts, okay? So demand is like your willingness to buy, it's how much you enjoy a product, Dem or quantity demanded is how many of those things you actually bought, okay? so. Uh, what this gets at, or what we'll be discussing, is what we call uh, the first law of demand, which simply states that as the price of a good rises, the quantity demand decreases. And the opposite is also true. As the price of a good falls, the quantity demanded increases. Okay, <clears throat> which is again saying that at high prices you want to buy very few, at low prices you want to buy more. In one sentence we could say uh, there is an inverse relationship between demand and quantity demanded, okay? So if I said to you that the price of Starbucks coffee decreased, your demand for Starbucks coffee wouldn't have changed but your quantity demanded would, okay? <clears throat> and so this is sort of what the big difference is. And this difference might seem pedantic or even just semantic, 
Uh, but the difference becomes huge and very, very important uh, as we continue on. So I want to really drill this into your head now, right? So if I said, you know, the price of this good fell from nine to eight, it would not be accurate to say your demand rose from two to three. It would be accurate to say that as the price falls from nine to eight, your quantity demanded increased from two to three. I know it sounds like I'm being picky, uh, but this is a hugely important thing. I will definitely be testing you on it as much as I possibly can. So please make sure uh, that you review this as many times as it takes to get this distinction right. If you're still having trouble with it, please feel free to come see me uh, or give me a call. My cell phone number is in the syllabus. So please contact me uh, in any way uh, so that I can help you understand this because I want you to get these questions right but they're of huge, tremendous importance, okay? This distinction is, is big, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, so we know that the quantity demanded can change as the price changes, okay? So if the quantity demand can change, we might be wondering if the demand can also change. And as it turns out, uh, the demand can, right? So demand can also change. Okay. And so uh, let's go through factors that shift demand or let's let's go through some of the, the things that shift demand. And so the first factor is a change in the number of consumers. All right. So if there are more consumers uh, that want to purchase the good, then what this means is that at all prices, the quantity demand will increase. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll draw another thing here and we'll say this is QD uh, with a tick mark, right? So if the, if the number of consumers increases, then at a price of 10, they will sell more than one. Let's say they sell three. And at a price of nine, they'll sell more than two and more than three. They might sell, let's say, five. And at eight, let's say seven. At six, we'll say nine. At five, we'll say uh, 11, and so on and so forth, right? And so what that would do is, uh, as the number of consumers increases, let's say we have D1, our initial demand curve, as the number of consumers increases, demand would shift to the right to D2. Okay, so an increase in demand is a shift to the right. Right? It's not up, it's to the right. Okay? <clears throat> and a, <coughs> excuse me, a decrease in demand is a shift to the left. Okay? So when demand decreases, we shift it straight to the left. When it increases, we shift it straight to the right. There's no up, there's no down to the right or to the left, okay? <clears throat> the change, an increase in the number of consumers will increase demand, a decrease in the number of consumers will decrease demand, okay? The second factor that shifts demand would be a change in tastes or preferences, okay? so. I'm willing to bet uh, that when you were a younger child, uh, vegetables were not something that you really enjoyed, right? You might say, oh, broccoli, gross, right? Or you know, spinach, yuck, right? But today, as an adult, uh, you might enjoy spinach and broccoli a lot more than you used to, right? <clears throat> and so in that case, if your taste or your preference for the good has increased, we would do the same thing. We'd say at all prices, you're willing to buy more than you used to. And so your demand would again 
shift out to the right. Okay? If you suddenly stopped liking something, so for example, when I was little, one of my favorite things to eat was grilled cheese. I loved it. Right? Today, <clears throat> I really don't like grilled cheese <clears throat> hardly at all. Right? It's just not something that I enjoy anymore. Why? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but grilled cheese and I do not get along very well. And so my demand for grilled cheese has shifted to the left as I got older. The third one <clears throat> would be a change in the price of a substitute. Okay, so let's pretend uh, that the price of Pepsi has fallen dramatically. Right, you can now get Pepsi for a nickel a gallon, let's say. Right, it's it's so incredibly cheap uh, that you can now buy it uh, for pennies. Right, and Coca-Cola still costs you a whole dollar or a dollar twenty-five even for just a little bottle. Right, and so Pepsi is now very very cheap. <clears throat> so what do you think that would do to your demand for Coca-Cola? Right. And so we would say that in that case, your demand <clears throat> for Coca-Cola would shift to the left. So as the price of Pepsi <clears throat> decreases, demand for Coke also decreases. Right, <clears throat> And the opposite would also be true. If the price of Pepsi rose, let's say Pepsi now cost a million dollars a bottle, right? Uh, your demand for Coke would increase, which is just saying that you are now more willing to buy Coca-Cola. Okay? <clears throat> the fourth uh, factor that shifts demand would be a change in the price of a complement. Okay, <clears throat> so a change in the price of a complement can also affect the demand curve. So let's say we have uh, hot dogs. Okay, we have our market for hot dogs and we have our demand curve and let's say uh, the price of hot dog buns falls, right? What would happen? Well, in this case, because the price of hot dog buns falls, and we know from the first law of demand, right, that as the price of a good falls, the quantity demanded increases, right? So we know that we want to buy more hot dog buns now, okay? <clears throat> and as we know from complements, Right? Complements are any two or more goods that are consumed together. Right? So if we're buying more hot dog buns, we probably want to buy more hot dogs as well. And so our demand for hot dogs would increase. Right? Price of hot dog buns falls, demand for hot dogs increases. Right? And then the opposite would also be true. If the price of hot dog buns rose, then the demand for hot dogs would decrease because we'd be buying fewer hot dog buns, which means we need fewer hot dogs. The fifth factor that affects demand is a change in the expected price of a Good. Okay, so this pen is probably worth about 25 cents at Staples, right? And you could buy a four pack of them for a dollar, right? They're nothing fancy, okay? And so let's say uh, that the price of four of these pens, so let me get four of them out, right? So I've got uh, four pens, all right? This four pack of pens is worth a dollar. Right? And tomorrow, it's going to be worth a dollar. 
and a week from now it'll be worth a dollar and a month from now it'll be worth a dollar and so on and so forth right and so you're not in any big rush uh, to go out and buy uh, these pens because their own their price is staying the same uh, there's nothing really valuable going on right it's just a pen okay but what if you knew that four packs of these pens we're going to be selling for, let's say, $100 in a month. So you know uh, with absolute certainty that four packs of, of these Pilot G2 pens will be selling for $100 each. And you can buy them right now for a dollar. What would you want to do? Right? Uh, my guess is that you would turn off this video Right? and you would run to your closest Staples or Office Depot or grocery store and you would buy as many of those pens as you possibly could and hoard them. Right, And so what we would say is that as the expected price of the good rises, your demand will also increase. Right, This is true uh, for real estate is like the most common example. So if you think that the price of homes is about to skyrocket, uh, then you will want to purchase a home now and sell it later. Right? Uh, if you think that the price of a stock is going to go up over the next year, you want to buy it now when the price is low so that you can sell it later when the price is high. Right? This is how economists illustrate that. Right? As the expected price of the good rises, the demand also increases. And then the opposite's also true. If the price, if the expected price of the good falls, right, if the price that we think we can get for the good in the future falls, then we want to buy less of it today and wait for the price to fall, right? We want to not buy today and buy it tomorrow, right? So if you knew that the price of gas was going to fall by a dollar uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, then you might avoid filling up your tank today and wait until tomorrow when gas was cheap. And the last factor that affects demand <clears throat> would be a change in income. Right? And this one uh, is a little bit complicated because uh, this one actually goes both ways. So let's flip this over and we'll do uh, number six, you know, change in income, and we'll break it down into two different types of goods. So we have what are called normal goods, and we have what are called inferior goods. Okay, so for normal goods, as your income rises, so too does your demand. Okay, so examples of this uh, housing, right? So as your income rises, you probably want to have a bigger house or maybe fewer roommates, which is the same thing as additional housing. Uh, you might want to buy uh, nicer cars, right? Um, go out to eat more often. Uh, let's see, you know, vacations, right? Uh, anything that you would buy more of if only you had more money would be a normal good. Uh, boats would be a great example. Etc. Okay, an inferior good, and and the opposite is also true. So as your income falls, you buy fewer of these things. So if you lose your job, you might consider renting out that extra bedroom, which is effectively having less houses, right, or less housing. Uh, you might uh, sell your nice car and buy a used car. You might cook at home more often, or take fewer vacations, or get a smaller boat, or even sell your boat. An inferior good is any good that as your income rises, you consume less or uh, your 
demand decreases. Okay, so uh, some examples. Uh, ramen noodles. At least the new the ramen noodles uh, from the grocery store. The cup of noodles. The you know the it's a dollar twenty five for eight of them, right? Uh, as your income rises, odds are you'll consume fewer of these, right? Uh, we could also say um, you know cheap beer. Right? So, Natty Light, for example. Uh, as you graduate from college, and since you've taken my class, obviously you'll be making a quarter million dollars a year. Um, you know, as you, you get your new job and you get more money, uh, odds are you'll switch from drinking Natty Light to uh, some kind of beer that is uh, better, or tastes better at least. Right? Um, we could say, uh, let's see, uh, typically apartments. Are an inferior good because you go live in a building instead of having uh, an entire house to yourself. But this is obviously uh, not universally true. There are plenty of, of very nice apartments in the world. Um, what else is an inferior good? Um, sometimes uh, mac and cheese, right? Um, you know, anything like that. It ha doesn't mean that the quality is low, even though I've listed uh, four things that uh, their quality can be quite low. The, the difference between an inferior good and a normal good has nothing to do with their quality, right? So nothing to do with quality. Everything to do with changes in income. Okay, so let's pretend uh, that you know you have a job, right? So you are you have a job, um, and because you have a job, you have cable TV and no Netflix. Okay. And then you lose your job, right? So you now you get rid of your cable TV, so no cable TV, and you decide to buy Netflix. Okay, so let's say you have your job and then you lose your job. Okay, in this world, for you, cable TV would be a normal good because you bought less of it. Your demand for it fell, right, <clears throat> as your income fell. So when your income was reduced, your demand for cable was also reduced. Okay? Netflix would be considered an inferior good in this case because when you had income, you didn't bother with Netflix. But once you lost your job, you decided to get a Netflix account or subscription. Okay? And so in this world, cable is a normal good, and Netflix is an inferior good. Okay? And so normal and inferior have nothing to do with anything about their quality, right? It's just easiest to point to low quality things as being inferior goods, but it doesn't have to be the case. The quality of the good has absolutely nothing to do with whether it's inferior or normal. It has everything to do with what happens to your demand as your income changes. Okay, and so these are the six factors that influence demand. Okay, so we've got a change in the number of consumers, a change in the taste and preferences, a change in the price of a substitute, a change in the price of a complement, a change in the expected price of a good, or a change in income. Notice that nothing was said about a change in the price of a good. There's a change in the expected price of the good, but the change in the price does not mean that demand changes. So when you can think of it like this, when you, if you saw that the price of Starbucks coffee decreased, okay, so now Starbucks coffee is cheaper, it does not mean that you enjoy Starbucks coffee more. Right, but 
because it's cheaper, you are willing to buy more. You will buy more coffee, right? And so you might buy more Starbucks coffee, but it doesn't mean that you enjoy Starbucks coffee any more than you used to, okay? And so in that case, we would say that your demand stayed exactly the same, okay? But your quantity demanded increased, okay? So here at a high price, you bought this many Starbucks. At a low price, you bought more Starbucks, okay? That's true. Economists don't quibble about that. But your demand for coffee, for Starbucks coffee, did not change at all, right? So that's a very important difference, okay? The only six factors that move demand are the ones we just listed. Changes in price is not one of them, okay? All right, next time we're going to be talking about supply.